Hi there. Today is Monday, June 22nd, 2024, and it is 6 10 p.m. in Culver City, California. And this is not going to be short, so I'm going to let you know now. This is going to take a little bit of time for you to sit down and not just watch, but process. And I would suggest watching it maybe two or three more times so that you get everything, because there's a lot for me to share. This project piece probably goes back about 20 years. If you'd ever been to mom and dad's house and you walked in the front door to the right were coffee tea tables, the kind that open up and top flips on top, dinner trays. <clears throat> on top of those dinner trays was a large blue backpack. Inside the closet, on the other side of the front door, was another large blue backpack. And the first time I visited them and saw that backpack, I asked them, what, what is that? What's, why you got this backpack here? You know, senior citizens with these big backpacks. They said, those are earthquake bags. I was like, oh, okay. I still didn't get it. <laughs> Until they explained that earthquakes happen so frequently here that it is um, advisable to have things like matches and candles and change of underwear and water, um, a radio, a compass. Uh, and they had all of that stuff and mom and dad would switch out the water every once in a while. It shouldn't sit in those plastic um, bottles for too long, <laughs> not for years and years and years. And, <clears throat> I thought it was quite interesting. I still lived in New York at the time. So we're going back probably to the 70s, late 70s. And I just thought it was interesting. Every time I came out here to visit, I always looked at that blue bag and I just thought that was kind of amazing. But I never got one for New York City because even though we're on a fault that is actually worse than the San Andreas fault here, New Yorkers don't think about stuff like that. You know, we just... We just don't, okay? Um, every once in a while, we might get a hurricane to come through. We definitely have some snowstorms where you can have um, four, five, six feet drifts. So that means it covers your car completely and you still got another two feet of snow on top of that, <laughs> okay? But a go bag, a survival bag, an earthquake bag was never something that I considered. I moved out here and believe it or not, I never had an earthquake bag. Never had a go bag, a survival bag. And I have visited quite a few Californians, their homes uh, since I've been out here 20 some odd years, and I've never seen anyone else with one, only mom and dad. Despite the fact that most of these people are native Californians, they're not transplants, they're not expatriates from another state or country. They don't have earthquake bags. Now, perhaps they have them in a the closet, but it's really supposed to be as close to your front door as possible so that you can grab it and go. You don't have to dig or look for it. Um, so a little bit of what I'm going to share has to do with that. However, uh, uh, let me start off by saying, uh, like I said, this is something that has been a while for me to project into. And I would say probably around August or so, I started to sit down and put together what I'm going to present. And it took about two or three months for me to pull it all together, do a lot, a lot of research, and to gather all the information that I needed to gather to present to all of you. I call you all my family whether you are blood relationship or not, or whether you are a good, good friend, best friend, excuse me, I consider you family. And as such, um, 
I would be derelict of duty to not share the things that I am going to share with you. And as an elder, um, I would also be derelict of duty by not sharing stuff that I have seen, I have processed, I have lived through, I have experienced, I know. Um, knowledge is only as good as what is shared. And truth is only as good as it being true and it's not conditional, it is universal. So today started off with me listening to praise and worship. And I just kind of like peeked at the clock and I'd say probably I've been listening to praise and worship for the last six or seven hours, nonstop. And the last 20 minutes, right before I sat down here, I just, I got in this bird. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you know what I mean. So I'm on a high right now. I am um, definitely infused with the Spirit of God right now. So there's another part, that being that, that I'm going to share in that regards. A piece that I need to say, or something I need to say, is that what I am going to share, I'm going to try to share it as best I can in a way that is understandable, that it is simple, that it is not conspiracy theory. The Word of God tells us that we are to be as wise as the serpent, but as gentle as the dove. And what that means in layman's terms is that we are supposed to know evil, but we're supposed to walk graciously. We're supposed to walk humbly. Uh, we're not supposed to beat anyone over the brow for whatever it is that they're doing that we may know is wrong or disillusioned about or that they just don't have the information of. That in all humility, we are supposed to, where it says that we're supposed to be at peace with all men, not some men. And man being man, woman, because Adam was made male and female, um, with all men, and it says in all holiness, which means having a humble spirit, having a spirit that truly is, as the word of God says, made in the image and likeness, the likeness of God is holy. It says, be holy because I'm holy. So what I'm going to share, I don't want you to automatically go to, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. What I want you to do is listen to it, look at what I'm sharing as I share my screen with you, and listen to the voice of God. It doesn't matter how smart I am. It doesn't matter how much word of God I know. You've got to hear the voice of God. You've got to hear the voice of God for yourself. Voice of God will tell you where to go what to do, how to do it, what not to do, what to say, what not to say, what to be, what not to be. For me, sometimes it's as simple as praying before I actually drive off in my vehicle and praying for a parking space, because I know I'm going someplace where parking spaces are really tight, and I always find a parking space. I've been doing this for like decades, praying for parking spaces. Coming from New York City, you got to, because there are like no parking spaces. Uh, so please listen, look at what I'm going to share, and then give time to hear, and then to process, and then to sit with it. I'm going to make interjections along the way. I'm going to make explanations along the way so that it, as I said, it's more palatable, it's more understandable, it seems more reasonable. Um, it doesn't sound like, like I said, like some kind of conspiracy theorist. I'm not that at all. Um, I listen to the voice of God, and I act on the voice of God. And there are times, like all of us, we miss it. You know, I have my self-will, and sometimes that gets in the way, and I do what I want to do, but I always back up, and I always apologize, and I get humble real fast. Um, so that I can get in the direction I'm supposed to go. Not my will be done, but his will be done. Amen. So I want to share something with you. Um, just one piece I'm going to start off with. And let me see if I can bring it up on the screen here. Um, screen share. Here we go. 
That's what I want. Screen share. And so this should be on your screen right now. It says, are you prepared? And somewhere before Christmas, a week or two ago, I shared with some of you, what would you do if? What would you do if this was the very last Christmas you ever celebrated, the very last New Year's you ever celebrated? And some people took it the wrong way and thought I was going about, I'm going to die and I'm never going to celebrate another Christmas or New Year's. That was totally, totally not it. It was just kind of a icebreaker. That's exactly what it was, an icebreaker for what I know I was going to do today. Um, so I want to go back over it again in a brief kind of way. What time of day are we in? It says that we are to know the time of day and um, how that merits out is that we're supposed to know our environment, our surroundings at all times. And that means the things that are going on in the world. And that is how we stay in line with the will of God as revelations and as his promises and as his direction is manifesting itself in the world, in our lives, in our family, in our city, in our home, so that we are in agreement. We are in one accord. And number three says, is your house in order? And a lot of times you hear that a physician will say that to a person who is on their deathbed or to the family, they need to get their house in order. How oh, that's not necessarily the only time it's used. I do a major, major cleaning of my house at least two to three times a year. Always in spring, always in fall. I'm getting my house in order. There's things that need to be thrown out. There's things that need to be rearranged. Um, there's things that need to be replaced. But having your house in order actually means having your life in order and having the things that pertain to your life in order. So it may be paying your the what you owe the IRS for taxes, or it may be making sure that you are on time for PTA. Have your house in order. Each and every one of us knows what that would mean, particularly for us. Number four, what is your emergency plan in a national disaster? And we're going to go over that in depth. That is something that we should have. I've shared with family members that I have at least two or three routes to get out of Culver City, to get to high places. Let's say there's a tsunami, um, how to hunker or bunker down if there's an earthquake. Um, folks have emergency, my emergency numbers, and I have emergency contacts of people. So it's that kind of stuff that we should have at the top of our head. The entire family household should know it. If it is a household that has more than two people in it, perhaps it should be somewhere on a refrigerator, on a mirror, somewhere where people know it, this is what we do. Let's go jump to it and go, okay? Do we have at least through your seven-day survival backpack or a go bag? You should have call MREs, meals ready to eat, Every household should have MREs. That's just the bottom line. MREs are good basically for five years, can last up to 20 years. So if you order them, you want to order them that have the latest production date and count five years after that. And as you're getting closer to that day, you can just sit down, you know, you go to the beach and you rip out your MRE so that you get rid of them and you can resupply yourself. So uh, really important. You should have that. Just like you have... Uh, Survival water in the house, water that is there in case of an emergency, water stops running, water gets contaminated, whatever happens, um, there's a drought, you've got water, you should have MREs as well. Do you know what to put in a survival backpack? We're going to go over that as well. And what do you think are the most important things to have in it? Of course, in going over that, we're going to talk about that. Um, here's a biggie. Do you know first aid and CPR? And if you do, is it recent enough in your knowledge bank to be comfortable to use it 
in a crisis. That's a biggie. I mean, a lot of us know the breathing, you know, breathe and uh, pre compression and breathe and compress. We know that, but do you know it for an infant? Do you know it just for adults? Um, do you know the rhythm, the rhythm of it, the count of it? Okay. Do you remember that? Do you have a Faraday bag for your laptop and phones? A Faraday blocks attacks on computers, cell phones in a serious crisis. An EMP may have been discharged. That means everything from EV cars to cell towers to computers, Google Homes will be fried. And that should actually be nine. It should be nine and 10. Um, that's real. That's real. If an EMP ever hit Los Angeles, everything turns into a brick. Everything. My brand new EV car, it is not going to work. My cell phones are not going to work. Computers are not going to work. So all of this modern technology that we have, we're going to be placed back in the Stone Age, literally, because we have become so dependent on modern technology. And here's the kicker. It's not just EV cars. It's all cars that are 20, 25 years old because all of them are operated by a, by, by a computer. So it's not just EV cars that are not going to work. It's gas-powered cars as well which is kind of a trip because it's like, well, it's gas powered. Yeah, but there's a computer that runs your gas powered car. It's going to be fried. So that is something to think about. How do I manage if an EMP ever goes off? What do I do? Because, you know, and if we live in any of these new developments, like I know some of us do, nothing, <laughs> you might be locked in your house because the door won't open up, you know? So it's, it's simple stuff like that that we have to consider, okay? Like I said, listen to the voice of God and hear what God says to you in regards to anything I share with you. That's really, really important, okay? And this is not to scare or disembowel or leave you in a panic. Absolutely not. I was a Boy Scout, and one of the first things that I learned as a Boy Scout is be prepared, okay? <laughs> be prepared. And I have lived that way my entire life since I was in seventh grade. I think of things in regards to how do I prepare myself for whatever is doing, whatever I'm getting into, whatever I'm coming out of, going into something else, how do I prep? Um, you know, cooks spend a lot of time prepping. You eat the meal at the restaurant, but the amount of time that goes into the prep of that meal is on a whole nother level. So preparation is really important. You know, stretching before you're working out, um, people just go out, I, I watch it all the time. They go to the gym, they don't prep. They just go and hit the machines or hit the weights and, and, and there's no prep. And believe it or not, your prep is more important than your workout. If you don't believe me, Google it. <laughs> anyway, are your children prepared emotionally and physically for a serious national disaster? Regardless of age, they should have some kind of acquaintance with what to do so that they respond accordingly. I crack up every time I'm watching a movie and the parent says, come, we got to go. And the child says, why? Why? Why is seconds taken away that could be life and death scenario? You don't ask why, you move, okay? <laughs> Whys don't, don't fit in crisis. It's like, I heard it, I move. And so that is something that children should understand and get clearly. That is not the time to get into a debate or um, want to have a lengthy explanation. Um, we will explain on the go, <laughs> okay? But not now. It's like, grab your coat, let's go. That's what it means. Grab your coat and go. Not why do I grab my coat and where am I going? That is a waste of time that could be critical and it could cause someone, if not everyone, to lose their life. It's as simple as that. Uh, we get car, house, and life insurance with the hope to never, ever have to use it. That's all but life insurance. My point is we should be prepared, especially since 
And I'm speaking now to everyone that I know is a Christian, and especially since we are Christians. You know, Jesus cursed the tree because that tree was not in the season that it should have been in. It didn't manifest itself. So when he looked at it, it's like, okay, something's off with this. This is not right. And he cursed it. And he said, you know, we are supposed to know the season. And that's really important. And right now, you're either you a person would either be asleep or dead on a, a on a cold slab um if they do not know that right now we are in a season that is nothing like the earth has ever experienced before that people are experiencing things like they have never experienced before whether it is countries whether it individuals whether it is systems, we are experiencing things that I'm going to say negatively that have never existed or existed to the degree that they are existing right now. And that enough is a wake up call. That enough is for us to go, hmm, I need to consider some things. So that's what this is all about. This is my opportunity as an elder to say, consider this. Okay, and so let me close this out. Um, stop that sheer. And um, what I want to share is this next thing. And this is the biggie. Okay, this is the biggie. I, Close this one out. Come back to share. Share screen. Okay. And this I call family legacy. And I'm going to read it. Please. Just close your eyes and listen to it. Um, you can read along with me. I may go slower than you for emphasis. But listen to what it says. The responsibility of the elders is to show and tell, in other words, to teach. By their life and lifestyle, a legacy is created. We've all heard the philosophy that children are to do better than their parents. However, that is not always the case. Before their dying days, the elders must do everything within their power to leave behind a roadmap, a GPS, we call it legacy. To do this, their life must be above reproach, as flawless as humanly possible. And the errors of their ways from childhood to present must have been reviewed, shared with family, and either resolved or still in the process of being fixed, overcome, managed towards successful outcomes. Legacy is old by nature because it is created and developed of decades, a lifetime. It has built-in challenges, obstacles for the majority of those who it is being left for. Often people think of legacy as money left in the will. However, that is not exactly true because so many wealthy and financially stable family members have left money for their family members only for the family members to spend it in a short period of time. Legacy is teaching those family members how to invest, create passive income, to understand the world stage, not just economically, but politically, spiritually, and holistically, so that the right decisions are made at least 90% of the time. The measuring rod for that is how many times we find ourselves trying to manage decisions, finances, drama, people, work, life. One episode, and I wholeheartedly believe and stand on this because I, I know it to be true. One episode every five years is a lot. 
People do what they want to do. So we can't avoid being thrown into scenarios we did not create. However, our own personal path should never interrupt, derail, confuse, or kill another human being's peace of mind, strength or spirit, physical health, will to do good, and be successful according to the knowledge of God. Part of our global antisocial mental deprivation financial struggles or to absolute wrong decision making is the lack of connection to the one true God. It's called Elohim, Adonai, the Alpha and Omega, the Trinity, Father, God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, also known as the Holy Ghost. I prefer Holy Spirit. When I hear Holy Ghost, I think of Casper the Ghost. I mean, that's, that's, I just do. That's also Our information in regard to anything in this world or not should come from a source that has all the information. If you are studying architecture, you want to go to the best university with the best professors who are not just teaching, but have written books, explored difficulties in the craft, and have come up with viable, provable solutions who may even be still researching. When it comes to knowing you want the best of the best information. God of Christianity has it all. That is why he's called the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning of everything, the end of everything, and everything that are yet to exist. He has the answer to it. This is why elders are so important. They have studied and learned, been successful and failed. They have seen and endured. They have walked, ran, and sat still. They have heard the voice of God, and they have heard his silence, which is a biggie. If God doesn't say anything, that means don't do anything. That doesn't mean we get near, you know, we start um, doing the hamster wheel thing where we just run and do and get out in front of God. If God is silent, it means do nothing. Just be silent. It says be still and know I'm God. Be still. I'm going to skip this part um, and go to the next one. And it says, it is written that man or woman who says there is no God is a fool, and that is true. Everything around us tells us there's a God. It's hard not to see that or understand that or believe that or know that. And in Joel, it says, I have poured out my spirit on all flesh, not some, not most, not Christians, not just Jews. All flesh means all, A-L-L, -L, in capital letters, neon lights flashing and blinking, all flesh, which means that we all have the propensity to hear from God, know God, walk with God in the coolness of the day, and be in his image and likeness, because that's how we were made, unless we are a demon in flesh. And that's a whole other story that's not for now. So, as the oldest member of the family unit, I say, hold on to my legacy. What I have shown you, what I have told you, so that you don't invest in fool's gold, also known as pyrite. And I mean that seriously. Uh, I call all of you family because that's how I feel about you. That is the place in my heart that I hold you dearly in. And we may not be blood relatives. We may be very close friends. But the reality is I classify you as family. My Brother and I never have used the word half, brother. We used to joke about that when we introduce ourselves um, afterwards because it says like, well, I got one half of your nose. Yeah, I got an eyeball. You got the other eyeball. Yeah, well, I got one ear. You got one ear. Well, my pinky is, I got one, you got one, half of what? <laughs> okay, we're brothers. Simple as that. So I don't believe in steps. I don't believe in halves. All of that, that's like, that just adds confusion and it actually kind of distances, you know, and that's the whole idea is that we are supposed to be at peace with all men and that's all men and in holiness. And in holiness, we are one body, the body of Christ, okay? So in knowing the time of day, I'm just going to go down this list because eventually um, I'm going to show you. Okay, number one is ALSDU flashlight. Number two is a fire starter, survival two. Number three is an emergency glow sticks. Number four is a portable survival hand saw. 
Number five is a military folding camping shovel. Number six is a 1,000 solar radio, um, solar radio, crank radio. Um, and number seven is um, a nuclear radiation detector. And number eight is a red triage personal radiation detector for the wallet. It's, re it's real small. It's about that big. It's, it's tiny. And it actually fits in your wallet up in your pocket. You know, it's a good thing to carry around all the time. Number nine is prepared hiking compass. Number 10 is a life straw for personal water filtering. Number 11 is a purif purifying uh, packets. Number 12 is an emergency poncho. 13 is a sleeping bag with hood. Number 14 is a gold time gear life tent. Um, number 15 is um, Andrew's Corners, and that is my suggestion for MREs. It's only six in a pack. The one I got, um, I believe, had 24 in it. So I got the, the large military issue. Um, and this is uh, for those who are vegetarians, number 16. Um, number 17 is uh, same, military MREs. Number 18 is a Duracell power station. It's 300 watts. Um, and number 19 is Duracell portable station. It's 1,000 watts. Um, and the next one is with, um, so first one is with backup port portable solar generator. And the next one down does not have the generator, OK? Number 21 is a nuclear earthquake and tsunami info. Number 22 is coveralls. So what you would use, DuPont is very good at making that. Um, they have so many different kinds. It's probably like 20 different kinds, depending on the environment. Um, a lot of them is um, made for work, but it's also good for us in, in the case of a nuclear disaster. Um, if you're in the, in the radius, you know, the first three rings of the radius of a nuclear blast, you're not going to survive. <laughs> However, if you are outside of that radius, which might be 100, 200 miles away, um, and you wear that, and you stay in the house, don't open up the windows, and you stay in the house, and you're eating your MREs and um, drinking your water, um, those, um, those coveralls really come in handy. Um, number 23 is the first aid equipment and medical training, which is really, really important. Um, and number 24, my recommendation is to take the police department civilian academy training, which I am, um, I put in my request to do it a couple of months ago and it starts in February. So hopefully I get approved so I can take my um, police department, Culver City Police Department Academy training. So here's the first one. This is the flashlight. I have two of them. One in my vehicle and one on a backpack, which I will show you later. Um, this is a torch. So you know how you see people striking two pieces of flint or stone. You see people doing the wood, doing like this. This is modern, okay? This eliminates all of that. You just scrape it and it sparks. End of story. You don't have to go through a lot of stuff. Glow sticks. I bought one pack. I'm going to buy another pack because I'm going to keep a pack of them in the car. Um, if any time there's a road emergency or there's someone that is disabled, I can stop, give them three or four, they can put them so that people don't run into them. Um, they last for 12 hours. So that's more than enough time for le police department, highway patrol, um, uh, fire engine, ambulance to get there. And this is a SOAR, 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 SAW, S-A-W, not S-A-R, W, <laughs> opens up and it is long enough for you to, and strong enough to go through a tree that is probably what? This is um, probably six inches in diameter. Um, so just a little bit of elbow grease, you'll get through it. Um, I have one of these, it's a shovel. I got the longest one, which is 24 inches. And this whole part allows you to, if the ground is solid, let's say it's frozen, you want to use this part here first to chop it up <laughs> before you use this. 
This here will allow you to get into areas where it is a little bit harsh and hard. Maybe some um, trees or, or roots are there. You, you use that and that will cut through the roots, makes it easy. Um, I bought this. This is really, really cool. If you look at it, it really isn't much bigger, longer than a cell phone. But this light here, very, very strong. And right here is a solar panel. So it charges up three ways. You can't see it, but on the back end of it is a crank where you crank it and that charges it up. It also holds batteries that cranks it up. Or you have a solar panel, which you can just sit out in the light and it charges up. Oh, here's a solar panel right here. Duh. So that's a solar panel right there. So you have three ways of charging it. It is an AM FM radio. It is a flashlight. And if you look right here, that's a compass. And it will charge your phone up at the same time as doing all of this stuff. Flashlight listening to. Again, because if there's an EMP, everything that is electrical that is built on a computer chip is not going to work. This is not. This is analog. Old fashioned. <laughs> so here we need to go back in time to work so we can survive. This is not, is not, there's no computer chips in that. Okay. So that gets away. And here is something that you would want to have. And it will tell you whether or not the air that you're in, the clothing you have on is radioactive and to what degree. So it, it's a Geiger counter but it's small, it's not large. This looks large, but it is about the size of a credit card, <laughs> okay? I have one, I'm gonna get another one, one that I will keep on me and one that I will hang on the side of my backpack. So it comes in real, real handy. And I thought I had actually taken that out of there, but I guess I didn't. Um, I have one of these, it's a compass. And it has a lanyard where you can hang it around your neck or hang it on the side of your backpack. And all you have to do is grab the side and look and see where you're going so you know where true north, east, and west is. And this is if you are at a lake. You take the top off, stick this end down in the water, and suck it up. It totally filters out all of the impurities, bacteria, and viruses, things known harmful to mankind. And so that makes it real simple, okay? These here um, go in water, and I forget the amount. I got a whole two packs of them. So I've got about 48 of these um, um, in two different um, go bags. And um, it, it, um, I think these one pack is for a gallon, I believe. 2.5 gallons. So that's more than enough water for you to survive. So the only thing you need is a deflatable, inflatable water container. Go on Amazon. And here's some. Here's another thing. I'm, I did a lot of research, but I'm going to leave it to you all to do your own research and come up with some stuff that fits you, your lifestyle, what you have or don't have. If you have a truck, you're going to have more things. Like right now, you can't see it, but I have two floodlight shining on me and it's stuff like that if you have a truck you want to have that okay that 1000 watt um charger is good for in the house and out of the house so if ever there is a blackout in your home you keep it charged up you can plug just about everything into that and everything's going to come on from your refrigerator to your cell phones to your tv to your computer with that 1,000 or 300 and um, you, maybe not the, the refrigerator or the, um, the dryer, washing machine, but your TV and cell phones, yes. So the 1,000 is really the one to go um, after. That is my advice for you. And if you have a large family, you probably do good to have a 300 and a 1,000, 300 for the kids and what they got, and a 1,000 for you because you need to be able to do what you need to do over a period of time. And um, there are charge panels. So with the, both the 300 and the 1,000, there are charge panels where 
As you're using it, you can have it be in charged at the same time. Okay, really important. This is a poncho that has the silver lining. So what happens is you put this poncho on, but your heat reflects inside of this and it keeps you warm because sometimes wet is also cold. And this is a hand size sleeping bag. There are companies that make these and depending on which one, this one is kind of expensive. I believe this one is like $18 for one. Whereas this one here, or maybe it's this one. I forget which one. Maybe it's this one. But one of them is like you get three for 18 and the other one is like $18 for one. So I don't know which one is which, but um, it's good to have those. And here are your MREs. This is the box that I have, um, that I had from this particular company. And um, they come, they come with, um, all kinds of meals. There are actually 12 non-vegetarian meals and there are six vegetarian meals. So you might want to break it up where you have the assortment of meat and eggs and all that kind of stuff for your family. And if you're someone in the family is a vegetarian, then you get the vegetarian MREs. I'm a vegetarian, so I have the, MR, the uh, vegetarian MREs, okay? And here is the solar panel, okay? I can't tell which one this is, but that's a solar panel. So it can be charging at the same time. And this one, I can't tell which one this is. Um, they both look the same, but I know one is, okay, does that one break it down? No, it doesn't. But just to give you a sense, here, let's just look at this one. This one is probably the 1,000, 14 charges, 168 hours with a light, 79 hours with a mini cooler, eight hours on a TV, 47 hours Wi-Fi. That's if it's in the house. You may have a drone outside. You may have a laptop outside. You may have the dual mini heat cooler. So one side heats, the other side is a cooler. That's, um, I forget the company, Cole, Coleman makes those. Um, and you may have a little, if you have a laptop, you don't need a TV, okay, if you're outdoors. Um, so that is something to consider as a purchase. Now, here it is. This is something that is important to know. The yellow fireball has a 590 foot radius, less than one millionth of one second after the bomb exploded, would emit a giant orange fireball filled with hot air and weapon debris, meaning that it is um, shrapnel. It's gonna tear up everything. Any buildings, objects, people caught within this radius would likely be, would burst into flames because of the heat. The green is 0.74 miles with in at least 15 minutes of a blast, clouds of dust, sand like radioactive part particles, what's referred to nuclear fallout, would reach the ground. Nuclear fallout can cause radiation poisoning, which damages the body cells and proves fatal. Estimated that between 50 and 9 percent of people within this radius could die from the acute effects of radiation. The blue gray area is air blasts of 1.4 miles, air blasts are powerful enough to topple residential buildings. They would likely also be widespread injuries and fatalities within this radius. The orange thermal radiation, 1.8 miles, people caught within this radius could experience third degree burns, severe scarring and dis disablement. And so here it is, I did it for Los Angeles. Estimated fatalities, 582,000. Estimated injuries, 1,454,320,000. And here's the reality. If it was dropped in Los Angeles, it will reach out to Burbank. Now here's the kicker. If there is ever a nuclear attack, it's not just one missile. 
they may shoot off anywhere from 100 to 1,000 missiles out of an arsenal of, I think Russia has like between 12 and 15,000. United States has less. We have a couple of thousand less than Russia. They're not going to shoot one, okay? This is for one. You figure our um, anti-missile network will take down perhaps half of those, if unfortunate, one third of those. So if a hundred are coming to Los Angeles and a hundred are going to Washington, D.C., and a hundred are going to New York City, 33 will hit each one of those cities or 50 will hit each one of those cities. And this will multiply exponentially, which means this will go towards the Rocky Mountains. And what happens in New York will go towards the Rocky Mountains. This will go down towards South and Central America. This will go up into Canada. That's the reality of it. And all of this has been affected by an EMP. And I don't know if any of you remember when St. Helena blew its top, her top. I lived in New York City at the time. It took a year. But all of the, the dust particles from that volcano exploding made their way across the Rocky Mountains all the way to the other side of the United States. It was a trip that for a while we had all of this silt falling down on cars and things like that. And if you've ever witnessed a fire in any parts of Los Angeles or Los Angeles County, you know you could be 10, 20, 30 miles away and all of a sudden you go outside, your car has all of this ash on it as a result of the fire, the forest fires. So I just wanted to share that with everyone. Um, it's important to know that we should have an earthquake bag or a go bag, survival bag. It's important. We live in an earthquake environment. A seven point quake can cause damage 100 to 150 miles away. A magnitude 7.5 quake on Plenty Hills Fault, which runs underneath the highly populated areas of LA and Orange counties, could kill 3,000 to 18,000 people. A 9.0 earthquake were to strike along California's sparsely north coast would have a catastrophic effect. And a giant tsunami created by the quake would wash away coastal towns destroy US 101 and cause $70 billion worth of damage over a large swath of our coast. And so it is important for us to understand what happens in this. I'm gonna send this to everyone in a YouTube video. So I'm explaining it and going over it now, but I want you to have it on hand for yourself, for your home, for your family, for your friends. A tsunami is treacherous and you may or may not have enough time to get away from it. And if you live in a flat area like Los Angeles, most of Los Angeles is gonna be wiped out. And I used to think that because Culver City was higher and there's a park, um, Kenneth Hahn Park, about a mile and a half away, that if I got in my truck and I went up to the top, I could escape it. And it turns out it wouldn't be good enough, even though it is of a high elevation that a tsunami would overrun it. And so again, it goes down to having an escape plan for every kind of hazard, no matter what it is, you should know what needs to be done. And here is the suits. So you will have this, you'll have that link where you can use, and it's really, really important for us to get training in first aid. I only cut and paste three 
adult first aid, first aid for severe trauma, and first aid for severe bleeding. There's probably about seven different categories here. One that is missing is for child, children. Um, it's really, really important. I know a lot of homes may have um, um, home paddles in the house, especially if there's someone that lives there that has heart condition. You've already been trained by a medical profession on how to use it um, to bring them back to life. That's up to you whether or not you want to have something like that as an emergency. Um, that's up to you. Um, there are all kinds of medical kits. So you'll have a picture of the medical kits, the trauma packs. Um, and I decided, also decided that he wanted to take the civilian, <clears throat> the civilian um, police academy um, classes. And so for three months, I will be in those classes and I am seriously looking forward to it. It is important that we know our police department, have a friendly relationship with our police department. If you're a criminal, you're gonna shy away from the police. Like every profession, there are good and bad, okay? I don't believe in defunding the police department. I believe that funding needs to be allocated in areas of great use that embolden, serve, and protect. Protect, okay? Um, and serve, serve. Um, our taxes pay their salary. And so there should be some reciprocal kind of um, relationship between police department and civilians. They are not separate from us, although some of them may take that attitude as if they are this distinct group. They are part of the community. And as part of the community, they have a responsibility to operate within the holistic aspect of a community. And so as an elder, as a pastor, as a man of God, as a man of color, of African and Native American descent, it is important, uh, indigenous, because Native American could be also other groups of North America, <laughs> so indigenous, um, that it is important that we are engaged in it. When I lived in New York City, I made a point that I was um, involved in the police department there. We had uh, the captain and some of his other officers come to our meetings, the meeting in my building, which um, uh, co-opted several other buildings um, on my block and had a meeting with them every month. And one time the captain said, well, you all complain a lot. And we said, because we don't like the numbers. And he said, but you've only had five crimes in the entire year. And we said, we don't want any crimes, <laughs> okay? Because the surrounding area had crimes, okay? You go on the outskirts of things and it's like crimes. Uh, but we didn't want any crimes. And as a result of that, as a result of our meetings and, you know, sharing this several times that we, we wanted to see that number go to zero, we got what is called a CPOP, which is a policeman in a cart that patrols the area. That is his responsibility. They are not in a police car. They are in a cart that looks like the postal cart. And sometimes they sit outside your building, but they circle, and my block was a, a large block. If you've ever seen the movie Gloria, I lived in that neighborhood. I actually lived around the corner from where both Glorias, the old one and the new one, were filmed. In my, in my building was a congressman, and in the building next to me was the mayor and his wife and his children. Um, that's, they had lived there their entire lives. Their children grew up in that building. Um, prior to him being elected as the mayor, when his office was over, he moved back into that building. So my block had had stability, let's say. And so when we asked for a CPOP, we got a CPOP. Um, and so it's that kind of stuff that we are, that's the kind of relationship you're supposed to have with your police department. We're not supposed to be afraid of our police department. Um, our police department, our sanitation department, our postal department, our fire department, all of those we are supposed to have 
some kind of relationship with, not just when someone is having a heart attack, you call a fire department, you should have gone down there at least once. And if you have a child, taking them down there so they can see the fire engines and the firemen can put them up on a fire engine and, you know, go, wow, you know. And um, um, I gave, took my grandson there and they gave him a little plastic fireman's hat, you know, cool stuff. Anyway, so again, I thought it was really, really important to share all of this with you. Um, I don't need to read any more. You will all have this. And uh, if I can just close this out, yeah, you will all have this. I love you and I care about you. And that's why I've done this. And here's a kicker. If you're Christian, this is what I heard. You got to sit down with the Lord on your own in here. But we won't be here for a nuclear attack. God's going to take us home before that happens. So in a sense, all of this is redundant. It's kind of like meaningless to us. However, I imagine that there's at least one person that you know that's not saved. They're the ones that's going to need this. In regards to an earthquake or tsunami, yeah, you should have this anyway. You should have this anyway especially if you live in California, especially if you live along the, 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 the fault line, if you live in New York and you live along the fault line, if you live in Florida where hurricanes are like a dime a dozen, if you live in the Midwest where there are cyclones and tornadoes, you should have you should consider this. In regards to radioactivity and nuclear warfare and you know bombs dropping on us, Dad told me, He's going to pull us out before any of that happens. So we will not see that day. So he said, this is not for you. This for those who are going to be left behind. Because there's going to be a level of chaos and pandemonium like the earth has never, ever seen. It's going to be worse than the wild, wild, they say the wild, wild west. Because it's wild. It didn't have law for a little while. It was You make up your own law as you go along which was lawlessness, you know, who was a kind of piracy on the, on the plains, okay? And <clears throat> if you're reading the Bible and you're paying attention to the time of day and you're reading Revelations, you know something is up. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to exegete that. I'm not going to be a prophet in that, listen to God for yourself. Read the Bible, read revelations, and then keep your ear open, your eyes open, your heart open, your spirit open, your mind open to hear what thus saith the Lord about any of this stuff. Okay? Again, I love you. Osa hug. <laughs> God bless you all. God bless you all. Ciao. <laughs> oh, boy.